Hi, welcome back to PC Builder. I'm Jason. Now in this video, we're gonna go step by step on what to do after building your PC and get you the best PC setup for gaming or productivity, including BIOS settings, Windows install, chipset and GPU drivers, testing your system performance and more to ensure that your gaming PC setup is amazing. If you get value out of the video, give it a like because it makes a huge difference to the channel, especially this guy right here. And of course, subscribe and click that bell icon. That way you get notified when we release cool content. With that, let's jump into it. Before that, this video is sponsored by VIP SCD Key. Say goodbye to crazy expensive Windows 10 licenses and that terrible activate Windows 10 watermark. Right now, use the links in the video description, head over to VIP SCD Key and get a Windows 10 Home or Pro OEM license for a great price. Pick your product license, then use the PC Builder discount code PC25 for an additional 25% off. Go to the activation settings on your PC, put in the code and boom, you have a fully licensed Windows 10 for a crazy low price, which can be upgraded for free to Windows 11. Use the links in the video description below. Now to get started, we need an internet connection and a USB drive between eight and 32 gigabytes in size, but not larger for our Windows install and our BIOS update. If your motherboard didn't come with Wi-Fi and you need it, you can always use a USB Wi-Fi adapter like this for about $15, which I will leave linked down in the video description. So step one, prep your USB drive for your BIOS update and your Windows install. You will need another PC to get your USB drive ready to go. So on the second PC with the USB drive plugged in, open File Explorer and then right click the drive and then format it as FAT32. Everything will be erased on this drive so don't have anything important on it. Then we'll create our Windows installation media. Use the link in the video description or just Google Windows installation media, then click on Windows 10 or 11 depending on your preference. Download the installation media and executable file and then run it by clicking on your browser or in your downloads folder. Then just follow the instructions to create a Windows installation media and select the USB drive. Once it finishes, let's grab the latest BIOS for your motherboard. So just go ahead and Google the board name and then go to the support page for your motherboard chipset and model. Now under downloads, find the BIOS listings and download the latest one. Then go ahead and extract that to your USB drive. Now eject the drive and we're done with the second PC. Step two. At your new PC, plug in the USB drive, turn on the power supply, and press the case power button. Go into the BIOS. You may need to mash the delete key at startup if our motherboard is MSI, Gigabyte, or ASUS, or the F2 key if your board is ASRock. Note that sometimes wireless keyboards don't connect in time to do this, so try a wired keyboard if necessary. BIOS screens look different based on the manufacturer and even the chipset. All of them start off in an easy mode, and then you can select a more advanced version. Quick note, if you have an MSI motherboard with a locked Intel CPU, like the i5-12400, it will ask you the very first time it posts what kind of cooler you're using, and if you're using a decent one, then select at least a tower air cooler, which will raise the power limits on the motherboard. We'll go over this later for other board makers. Here's an important troubleshooting note. If you make changes in the BIOS and your PC won't boot afterwards, you can reset the BIOS to its default by clearing the CMOS on your motherboard using the included instructions. Now this is always done with a PC unplugged, no power whatsoever. And either your motherboard has a clear CMOS button on the back IO panel or on the board that you hold down, or it has two pins that you're gonna use a screwdriver to touch at the same time for about 10 seconds. This will reset your BIOS to the default settings and you should now be able to boot. You will need to make any changes you've made previously again. Remember, everything is back to default. Now let's go ahead and update the BIOS if we didn't do a BIOS flashback as part of the build process. And if we did, we just wanna make sure that we are in fact on that BIOS version. Using the latest BIOS will solve so many issues like RGB lights not working or devices not being recognized correctly. So this is the first thing that we always do. For MSI, Gigabyte, and ASUS boards, the version is listed right after BIOS VER period. For ASRock boards, the BIOS is listed right after the motherboard name, usually beginning with a P. If you're on the latest version, great, skip ahead. If not, let's update that BIOS right now. Gigabyte, MSI, and ASRock have BIOS update available on the easy menu. Gigabyte calls it QFlash, MSI calls it MFlash, and ASRock listed under tools called Instant Flash. For ASUS boards, you'll need to go to the advanced mode, then under tools, you'll find Easy Flash. Once you have the flash tool selected, make sure your USB drive is plugged in. Check your motherboard manual to see if there's a specific slot, but more than likely any will do. Select the BIOS file name and 
follow the on-screen instructions to begin flashing the BIOS. Do not unplug or power down your PC while this is happening. Now this can take anywhere from a couple minutes to up to eight minutes and the PC may actually reboot itself several times during the process. Now, after our PC boots, remember, mash that F2 or delete key to get back into the BIOS, but don't change anything else in the BIOS just yet. Our PC is stable right now, and we don't want it to crash during Windows or driver installs, so we'll come back and make changes later. Right now, just make sure you see the physical RAM sticks and your drives that were installed in the Easy BIOS view. If you don't see a drive or a RAM stick, turn the PC off, make sure everything is physically seated and troubleshoot it. If you do see everything, then go ahead and go to save and exit and this will reboot the PC. Remember to have your USB drive plugged in during this process. Now let's get Windows installed. After we save and restart in the BIOS, make sure our USB drive is plugged in with the Windows installation media on it. Now we're gonna follow the prompts to install Windows. You will be prompted to put in a license key if you have one. You can also skip this step, selecting the version that we want to install and the drive that we want to install it on if you have more than one. It is possible to use Windows unlicensed, You'll just lose personalization options and you'll have a watermark in the bottom right hand portion of the screen. I'll leave a link to a Windows key reseller that we use and is a sponsor on the channel. And I'll leave an Amazon link to buy it from Microsoft as well. And you can just choose which is right for you. Let Windows install do its thing. This can take a little bit of time. Once it's installed, go ahead and configure Windows in whatever way you want. I usually skip most of the optional stuff and opt out of anything I can, but it is up to you. Once we're in Windows, the very next thing that I do is type Windows Update in the search bar, and then I search for updates and install them. Just keep repeating this process until there are no more updates to install, and note you'll likely have to reboot your PC a couple of times. I also go ahead under the advanced options and select the items to allow Windows to download and install future updates to save the hassle, including notifying me when it's ready to restart for an update. With Windows installed and fully updated, now let's go ahead and start with the most critical drivers to install, starting with the chipset driver. If you have an AMD CPU, Google AMD chipset driver, or use the link that I've provided in the video description. And if you have an Intel CPU, either Google Intel chipset driver, or use the link I've provided in the video description. Both AMD and Intel have an auto detect and install app, and I really recommend that. These will also install the integrated graphics drivers, and if you have a dedicated GPU made by the same company, it's also gonna install drivers for the GPU as well as for their GPU control center. The Intel app will also let you know in the future if a new chipset driver becomes available and will help you install it. Just download the application and then click to launch it in the browser download window. If you wanna do it manually instead, you can navigate to the download menus for chipset, then your board chipset model, and download the installer. Once you've downloaded the installer, go ahead and run it. Go through all the various menus it needs in order to set up and select what you're doing, and you'll more than likely need to reboot the PC after you're done installing the drivers. Now let's get the rest of the motherboard and device drivers. Now there's two ways to do this. The first is to go to the motherboard support page for your motherboard. You can just go ahead and Google it and download and install the latest driver for each device, including Wi-Fi, audio, network drivers, and more. Or you can download and install the motherboard update application from your motherboard manufacturer. For Gigabyte, this is called App Center. For ASUS, it's called Armory. For MSI, it's called Control Center. And for ASRock, it's called the App Shop. Now these all work fine for these type of updates, but just note that some of them will include bloatware in the list of recommended updates. Of course, you can just uncheck the bloatware, but just make sure to go over the list of what's being installed before pushing the update button. Personally, I do use all of them for driver updates, but I only download the apps that are actually useful to me, like the Windows BIOS update utilities, fan control software, and possibly the RGB software if needed. If you do choose to instead download them all individually, just download and run each application individually, restarting the PC if necessary until you don't have any more updates. Now let's get our GPU driver installed if we didn't just install it with our chipset drivers. For AMD graphics cards, just go to the driver download page we use for the chipset, again, link down in the video description, and select graphics and follow the prompts to select your GPU or use the easy installer. This will also install Radeon Adrenaline, which is their control panel, which you should jump into once it's installed by clicking on the icon in the system tray or launching it from the desktop. 
Here we just want to make sure to go to the display tab and make sure that AMD FreeSync is set to enabled. For Nvidia, we first want to double click the Nvidia icon in the system tray and accept the agreement to get it going. One setting I always change here is under manage 3D settings, scroll all the way down to power management mode and select prefer maximum performance, then click apply. This essentially disables the GPU from running in a lower power mode. Next we want to Google download Nvidia GeForce Experience and click on the link, or again, use the link that I have provided down in the video description. Install GeForce Experience and then open GeForce Experience. You can find it using the search bar in Windows by typing in GeForce Experience. You'll need to log in either by creating an NVIDIA login and confirming by email or using a Google account. Now you also might have to confirm the login by email. NVIDIA doesn't make it easy. Once you're in, select the drivers in the upper left hand corner. It will likely tell you there's a game ready driver to download. But if you're primarily a productivity user, so video editing, animation, etc., click the three white dots on the right hand side of the window and select Studio Driver instead. Then check for updates again. Go ahead and download the driver and then select Install using the Express installation. The screen will flicker several times and a screen will pop up indicating you've updated your drivers and it may tell you that a reboot is required. Go ahead and do that now if necessary. If instead you have an Intel Arc dedicated graphics card, go ahead and do the same procedure we did for the Intel chipset drivers or use the link down in the video description that we've provided, download the auto installer, run through the menu system and that will give you the drivers that you need as well as installing their command center software which is how you control the GPU. Alright with our GPU driver installed let's make sure that our monitor resolution and refresh rate is set correctly. Right click anywhere on the desktop and select display settings. Under display resolution make sure your monitor is set to its maximum resolution then scroll down to advanced display settings. At the top of the new menu we can select our display if we have more than one and at the bottom you can set the refresh rate. Go ahead and select the monitor's maximum refresh rate. We can now close this window. If we have more than one display we can also select the monitor orientation to fit our actual setup and we can also change which monitor is our primary monitor where all of the windows taskbar and other user interface items go. Let's also set the windows power plan to high performance. In the search bar, type choose power plan or find it in the settings. Now select the high performance plan. Note that sometimes it's hiding under show additional plans so click the down arrow. You can change how long until your screen turns off and how long until your system goes to sleep as well. There are deeper options here but high performance should set them all the way we want them. Once we've updated all the motherboard drivers it's time to crank up our PC's performance by rebooting and jumping into the BIOS. Remember with Gigabyte, MSI and ASUS boards we want to hold down the delete key until the BIOS pops up. With ASRock boards it's usually the F2 key. Note that wireless keyboards sometimes don't initialize fast enough to do this. If you're having a hard time getting into the BIOS in Windows you can type in advanced startup options into the Windows search bar. Click restart now under advanced startup and then your PC will reboot to a blue screen with options. Under troubleshoot select advanced options then under advanced options select UEFI firmware settings and then click the restart button on the screen and that will automatically reboot and load the BIOS. Now that we're in the BIOS let's make sure that resizable bar is turned on. This is also known as smart access memory for AMD and for some reason ASRock calls it CAM CAM. Most boards will have this enabled by default. While there are maybe a couple games where this slightly reduces performance in the vast majority of those that support it it's free performance. Most easy BIOSes now let you click one button on the front page labeled resizable bar or smart access memory to change all the necessary settings. But if you don't have that option then you want to go to the advanced BIOS tab, find the advanced PCIe sub settings option, enable above 4G decoding, then an option will pop up to enable resizable bar. Now we also need to go to the boot options, go to boot CSM which stands for compatibility support module and turn off launch CSM. And now resizable bar is enabled. Now let's clock up our RAM to its full rated speed. On the Easy BIOS page you should be able to enable XMP, DOCP or Expo timings using a drop down menu and selecting the profile that was advertised for your RAM. Go ahead and save and exit. This is usually F10 in most BIOSes. Your PC may take a while to boot and it actually may reboot several times as it trains the RAM at this speed. If you do have LED debug lights they'll usually flash, usually yellow for the RAM 
And finally, you should get a post. When you get a video signal again, mash your key to get into the BIOS. Remember, delete for MSI, Gigabyte, and ASUS, F2 for ASRock. Now on the Easy BIOS page, the RAM may still be listed at the base frequency, but find the hardware monitor section, and this will tell you what it's actually running at, which should be the full rated speed. If we don't post after changing the RAM settings, then we have an issue and you'll need to follow your motherboard instructions to clear the CMOS. Ensure you can post with a reboot, then try one stick at a time using XMP. See your motherboard manual for which slot to use with one stick, but it's usually the first slot. If one stick works but the other doesn't, you probably need to RMA your RAM kit. If you can't get either stick to post using the overclocking profile, then you'll need to troubleshoot your RAM, which can get very complicated. Usually RAM just works, but RAM troubleshooting could be a whole video. So if you need help, revert to the QVL RAM list for your motherboard and try getting support from somewhere like Build a PC Reddit, PC Part Picker Forums, or Linus Tech Tip Forums. Once we get our RAM clocked up, now it's time to make sure that we're getting the most out of our CPU. For AMD CPUs, we can enable Precision Boost Overdrive. Typically, this needs to get done in two places. Go to the Advanced tab, then click on AMD Overclocking. You'll be warned this could hurt your CPU if done improperly. Don't worry, we're not manually overclocking, we're just going to use AMD's advertised utility. So go ahead and accept it. Now under Precision Boost Overdrive, change this from Auto to Enabled. Now we go under the Tweaker tab, again we find Precision Boost Overdrive and change that to Enabled. Alternatively, if you want to go the other direction and enable Eco Mode on Ryzen 7000 CPUs with an X, which will force them down to a lower TDP, you can do the same thing except choose AMD Eco Mode under the PBO drop-down menus. For Intel Lock CPUs on some B-series motherboards, we can also lift the power limits. Now MSI asks the first time your board posts in an easy menu, or anytime you clear the CMOS. Simply select the tower air or water cooler option rather than the box cooler one. For other Intel B-series motherboards, it varies heavily, and some boards do not allow you to change the power limits at all. Many boards come with power limits disabled out of the box, so just double check that you even need to do this. If your board comes limited, and it is possible to change the limits, the settings will be under the Advanced BIOS. Under the Tweaker tab, you'll find something called Advanced CPU Settings. Click that and it should give you a range of options. You're looking for turbo power limits and you want to change that from Auto to Enabled and that should show you a whole range of new options. Under PL1 and PL2, you can now change the power limits. For locked i5 and i7 parts, a setting of 155 watts should be sufficient, though you should make sure your motherboard has sufficient VRMs and VRMs cooling. The highest max boost on the locked Intel CPUs is the i9-13900 at 219 watts. And you can double check your CPU's maximum boost by going to it and clicking on the Intel ARC, ARC with a K, listing. Again, make sure that your motherboard can handle this before mindlessly changing this setting. If at any point you're unable to change the settings discussed, it's likely that the board that you have just won't allow you to do so. Let's talk about overclocking Intel K CPUs and all the AMD CPUs. For unlocked Intel CPUs with a K, you can also do overclocking here, but that does go beyond the scope of this setup guide. I will, however, leave a link to an Intel article that goes through the basics in the video description. For AMD CPUs, overclocking, it's largely worthless, as you'll get almost all that performance just by enabling Precision Boost Overdrive. Now this is also a time we can undervolt our CPU, but only if you really know what you're doing, as it's very easy to introduce stability issues in your system in lightly threaded workloads without realizing it. Even if your system passes a stress test, you'll just get seemingly random crashes. That's why I don't recommend it for most users, though if you want to try it, there are several guides out there on how to do it. Let's go ahead and tweak our fan curve. Now we can either do this in the BIOS or use a third-party software application. For Gigabyte and MSI boards, I typically use the BIOS settings for them. For ASUS boards, I typically use the Fan Expert application in their AI suite, which you download from Armory Crate. For ASRock boards, I honestly don't have enough recent experience to make a recommendation, but using the BIOS is always viable. Since all of these are so different, here's generally what I try to do. I like a quieter system with the understanding that it's going to run a little hotter. The first thing that I try is the included auto-tuning feature for any of these programs, and I usually check the box that allows the case fans to stop under a certain temperature. 
If that seems good, I don't really make any other adjustments. If after using the system for a while I feel it's too loud, I'll go back in later and manually adjust to have the fans ramp up slower. For AIO pumps, I try to set them at 100% at all time, but if they are a little too noisy, I'll back that down, but I typically do not go below 75%. I usually let the CPU fans ramp up faster as those are the ones that are really harder to hear. Case fans are typically easier to hear because they're right there on the edge of the case. My advice, play around with it until you get something that you like. And if you have a particular fan control program that you use and you really love, leave it down in the comment section and mention what you like about it. Now let's jump into Windows and do some basic benchmarking of our system. Let's go to the Microsoft Store and download and install Cinebench R23 for free. Then let's download Hardware Info 64 or HW64 for short. I'll leave a link in the video description. In Hardware Info, find the CPU zero list and then right click on the CPU die average temperature and add it to your system tray. Now scroll down to your dedicated GPU. Make sure it's the right one if your CPU has an integrated GPU and find the GPU temperature. Right click and add that to the tray. Then find the core effective clocks and average effective clocks for your CPU. Close everything except Cinebench R23 and Hardware Info. Even right clicking icons in the bottom right hand tray to see if you can exit them. Now with Cinebench R23 open on one side of the screen and Hardware Info on the other, run the 10 minute thermal throttle multi-core test on your CPU. Note the maximum clock speed, the maximum CPU temperature, and whether the CPU temperature initially spikes then just settles back a bit or just keeps increasing. After the test, also check in on the thermal throttle indicators at the bottom of the CPU temperature section. If we thermal throttle with Ryzen 5000, Ryzen 7000, or a locked Intel CPU, then we need to investigate why. Is our CPU cooling or case airflow insufficient? Is our cooler properly installed? Remember, this was a worst case scenario test, so we should be seeing relatively high temps, but without thermal throttling. We do expect thermal throttling on many 12th and 13th gen Intel overclockable CPUs on Z series motherboards, especially the 13th gen i7 and i9, as they're using insane amounts of power, which is why we recommend increased cooling and case airflow for them. After we do this in Cinebench R23 under file, select advanced. You can now turn off the time duration. Run three tests of each of the single core and multi-core tests and note the highest score. Compare that against the CG director list of scores for your CPU, which I've linked down in the video description. We'd like to see ourselves within about 10% here, but do note that these scores can vary a lot, so try running a couple more if you aren't there. If you do have a performance issue, this is a good time to investigate why or get help if you don't know where to go. Remember, if you got value out of the video, give it a like because it really helps out the channel and this guy really appreciates it right here. And of course, subscribe and click that bell icon that way you get notified when we release cool content. Now, this is a challenging topic, so if you feel we can improve any section or if there's something that you think we should add in the future, let me know down in the comments. If you haven't checked out our 2023 PC build guide, check out it out right here. We go through everything that you need to know for both Intel and AMD CPUs from start to finish. And we'll catch you on the next one.